What's up, everybody? Welcome once again to iTown Church. My name is Adam, one of the pastors here. Would you help me in joining all of our other campuses, welcoming them to church this morning? We see you, Mudsock and Bluffton. We're so glad you're here. Of course, the correctional facilities that are joining us, as well as those of you who are joining us online. Thank you so much for being here today. I'm honored to share today. Obviously, we're excited to have Pastors Dave and Kate back soon, but uh, in the meantime, would you continue to join me in praying for our pastors as Pastor Chris Hodges uh, shared just a few weeks ago. Let's continue to pray for them that this season of rest will be one of refreshing and encouragement, uh, and we know that the fall is going to be a lot of fun. We're excited to have them back. But over these next few weeks, we are jumping into a series called The Early church. We're studying the first several chapters of the book of Acts and what ministry was like as Jesus left this earth, because I've always kind of found this part of, of history intriguing, because of course we study Jesus's life a lot, and I think that's important. Obviously, Jesus coming to this earth was crucial and, and, and foundational to what we do and who we are, but I love this interesting part after Jesus leaves, because I think it most closely mirrors the life that we lead. And I can't help but put myself in the shoes of the disciples and like they got to do ministry with Jesus, but now all of a sudden he's gone. And it's like, oh, it's just, it's just us now. <laughs> Except if you've read the book, then you know it's not just them. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Acts starts off recalling these words of Jesus in Acts chapter 1, starting in verse 4. Jesus tells the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John baptized with water, but in just a few days, you'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you'll be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere, in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And I love that passage for a few reasons. One that we'll study more in depth for most of the message today is that we don't have to do this alone. The Holy Spirit is with us and empowers us to live this life and make us better than we are on our own. But the other thing I love about this passage is that the Holy Spirit's empowerment isn't just for our own benefit, it's for others. It's because they're gonna be witnesses into Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria to the ends of the earth, like go and tell people about me, go help people, go serve people, go love people. And that's what the Holy Spirit does for us. And yet so often these gifts of the Spirit and the Holy Spirit and all of those things oftentimes get turned into a selfish motivation or they get twisted for selfish purposes. And I just want us to keep in mind that the Holy Spirit is for others. The Holy Spirit and the empowerment that he gives to us, the, the gifts and the way that he changes us is, so, is to help serve others. So I want to say it as clearly as I can. The Holy Spirit makes us better but more importantly, the Holy Spirit empowers us to serve better, to love better, to help people better. And so Jesus tells the disciples, look, don't go anywhere, don't do anything, don't do ministry by yourself. So he tells them, wait for the Holy Spirit. And so let's jump to that point in Acts chapter two. And if you have your Bible, you can turn to Acts. We're gonna be in those first few chapters for our time together. But of course, it's all gonna be on the screen or in the iTown app. But Acts chapter two, this is the moment that Jesus is talking about. In verse one, it says, on the day of Pentecost, all the believers were meeting together in one place. So first of all, let me pause. This day of Pentecost, if you've been around church, you've heard of the day of Pentecost before. But 
This is, was, this is specifically usually the day that they're referring to. Pentecost was actually an annual holiday. Pentecost means 50th. And so it was actually the 50th day after Passover. So the, the, they were all, the believers were already meeting together to celebrate this day of, of Pentecost, this celebration that was happening. When suddenly there was a sound from heaven like the roaring of a mighty windstorm and it filled the house where they were sitting. Then what looked like flames or tongues of fire appeared and settled on each of them and everyone present was filled with the Holy Spirit and began speaking in other languages as the Holy Spirit gave them this, avail this ability. And so they're here together in this place. This is the moment that they've been waiting for and there's some things that transpire in these first few chapters and really throughout the book of Acts that I want to study because I particularly want to look at Peter's life and his transformation through the power of the Holy Spirit. As we dive into this series, the early church, we're really digging through the first half of the book of Acts and there are two key figures in this, in this book. The first bit, we talk mostly about Peter, and then the second two-thirds of it, the, the, the finish of it, we talk mostly about a guy named Paul. These are two key figures, and if you remember, Jesus kind of made Peter the leader of the early church. In Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus says to Peter, now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock, and upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. So, Peter is pretty foundational. Now, if you've read the Bible much, sometimes it feels like Jesus arbitrarily like just changes people's names. Like, what's your name, Simon? No, 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 you don't look like a Simon. You're more like a Peter. Like, I'm just gonna call you Peter now. Simon's too hard to remember. I'm just, I know a bunch of other Simons, so I'm just gonna call you Peter instead. But that's not what happens. In these days, their names had a lot of meaning. And so he doesn't like change his, he doesn't change his name only, he changes his identity, he changes who he is. He's like, you are, you are rock. I'm gonna call you rock because on this rock, the church will be built and the gates of hell will not stand against it. So Peter is this foundational guy. He's often seen as the apostle to the Jews, apostle to the, those, the, the religious in crowd already. When Paul comes into the scene, he's really known as the apostle to the Gentiles. Now, Gentile is just a fancy word for not Jewish. So Peter has all the, he's the apostle to the Jews. Paul is the apostle to everybody else. And so I want to dig in to this beginning portion of Acts and talk about Peter because the work of the early church begins amongst the Jews. And later in the series, we'll get to Paul and the Gentiles but there are several things that I want to dig into the, the transformation that happens in Peter's life by being empowered by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit comes upon them. They start talking in all sorts of languages. And here is the people's response in Acts 2, verse 13. It says, others in the crowd ridiculed them, saying, oh, they're just drunk, that's all. Like apparently when you get drunk, you start speaking in languages that you didn't speak before. Uh, all of a sudden, they're speaking Spanish and had no idea. So then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem. Make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. <laughs> they didn't hit the bottomless mimosas, okay? They're, it's too early for that they're actually filled with the Holy Spirit. But we see this change in the life of Peter because Peter was not this, uh, was not this bold. We, we, see, we hear him say, he says, listen carefully, make no mistake. And that's the first thing that I want us to observe about how the Holy Spirit empowered Peter is that the Holy Spirit empowered Peter to be bold. Jot that down if you're taking notes. The Holy Spirit empowered Peter to be bold. Because if we look at Peter during his time with Jesus in his earthly ministry, the guy had some potential, but he was honestly kind of wishy-washy. Like he fell asleep in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is out here like praying right before he's to go to the cross. I mean, he's wrestling with God. He's sweating blood. Like he's in one of his like most intense moments of his earthly life. And he's like, look, stay awake and pray, with, pray for me, would you? And three different times, Peter and the other couple of disciples that were with them fall asleep. 
At the Last Supper, he tells Jesus that he's ready to go to prison and to die with him. And yet, just as Jesus predicted, he denied him three times that very night. There was potential there, but he just wasn't quite there yet. And I think we all know somebody like that that's got the potential, but they're not quite there yet. And I think what Peter needs is he needs his glow up moment, right? Like he needs, he's there, he's clo- there's something there, but it's just not, we got to unlock that. And I can relate to that. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're looking like, you're like, yeah, this guy needs a glow up moment. Uh, but I'm going to prove to you that this is the after photo and not the before, okay? Because... <laughs> I've got some photo, photographic evidence. So first of all, I was a cute kid. Uh, this is me. I was, that's me with my grandpa. Uh, I was a cute kid. But then things went a little south when I went to high school because I grew my hair out. And just in time for senior pictures, my mom wanted to force me to cut my hair. And so we compromised. <laughs> and uh, it was not good. We both lost out on that deal. This is the first time since high school these photos have surfaced. My mom bought the package where you get the little wallets to hand out to your friends. I handled out none of them. Like I, I kept all of them and this is the first time anybody's seen them. So don't compromise on the haircut. Go one way or another, but don't, don't do it in the middle. It's somehow, it's, it's just bad. But somehow it gets worse. Uh, uh, I've never done drugs in my life, but I don't think I'm gonna convince anyone of that with this photo. Now, for some it may seem like it can't get any worse, and maybe it doesn't, but I'll let you decide. So I was in a band, and uh, I don't know, like I bought a hair straightener uh, for some reason. Now this was about the time that my wife met me, and so if you judge me, judge her, because she fell in love with that. Uh, And yes, that is a mustache, uh, but you could see in the last photo that I definitely couldn't grow a beard, and so that was the best I could do. And when, when her and I got together, I don't know if she felt like she needed to just like tear the whole thing down to the studs and start from scratch, but this is what I looked like when we got married. Uh, So buzzed head, shaved, like just, nothing. Uh, And she's always looked beautiful, but she looks like she married a 12 year old. And and from there, it's all all uphill. So when I say this is the glow up, maybe now you believe me. Uh, So it could be a lot worse, okay? It could be a lot worse. But on a more serious note, the truth is, is that I failed out of speech class in college. I hated it. Uh, I was not good at it. And you never could have convinced me to get on a stage in front of anybody and talk about anything. But that was something that the Holy Spirit gave me the boldness to do and the confidence to do. And, and so I just want to encourage you in that, that the Holy Spirit can make you bold. The Holy Spirit gives you things that you didn't have on your own. And Peter needed that. Peter was a well-intentioned, compromised haircut, terribly mustachioed guy. And And the Holy Spirit changed something in him. Let's look at how the Holy Spirit changed that. After denying Jesus to even a little girl, the Bible says that a girl was like, hey, I think this guy was with Jesus. He's like, no, 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 I don't don't know what you're talking about. Even to a little girl. Now Peter stands in front of thousands and says this after the Holy Spirit comes upon them in Acts 2.22. He says, people of Israel, listen God publicly endorsed Jesus the Nazarene by doing powerful miracles, wonders, and signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. With the help of the lawless Gentiles, you nailed him to a cross and killed him. But God released him from the horrors of death and raised him back to life, for death could not keep him in its grip. First of all, can I get an amen from somebody? Come on, that's that's good preaching from Peter. But talk about a 180, like talk about just a totally, totally different person. This man is preaching with boldness. Like he couldn't tell a little girl that he even knew Jesus. And now he's sharing the gospel boldly, like not shying away from anything. Like you killed him, but it's all right because God made it work out. But you guys did this. 
And the Bible says that 3,000 people that day were saved, baptized, and joined the early church movement because he was bold. That's the difference that this boldness from the Holy Spirit can make. And so after his speech, Peter continued to preach, and he he, uh, healed a guy who had been uh, unable to walk since birth. He was in his 40s, and he preached some more, and all of this got the attention of a group called the Sanhedrin. Now, the Sanhedrin was a a Jewish judicial assembly, a group of judges. They were kind of the religious law protectors, and they really didn't like this new group of Jesus followers. They weren't yet called Christians. They didn't have a name for them. They were still Jews, but they followed Jesus, and they were breaking off from the norm. They were breaking and, and bucking the system a bit, and these leaders, the Sanhedrin, were really bent on control. They wanted to make sure that everything fit perfectly in the box and the laws that they had, and and they were causing some problems. These Jesus followers were causing some problems for them. And so after Peter and John heal the guy who couldn't walk, they, they got arrested, and they stand before the Sanhedrin, and the Sanhedrin are interrogating them. And this is what Peter said, Acts 4 now, in verse 8. I love this verse. It says, then Peter filled with the Holy Spirit, like just to remind us, this is not Peter on his own, this is Peter with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you know, do you wanna know why he, how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you, to all the people of Israel, that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, the man you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Again, boldness from a man who just a few months earlier had just completely denied Jesus. Even after he denied Jesus, Jesus predicted it. He said, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. On that third time that he was denying him, before he was finished speaking, he heard the rooster crow. For most of us, I feel like that would be a wake-up call. Like, oh, dang, that was, that was it. Jesus, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get to it now. But after Jesus' death and, and resurrection, before he ascended to heaven, he appeared to the disciples a few times. And, and the account when he appears to Peter, Peter's out fishing. They had gone back to fishing. That's what he did before he had met Jesus. So he wasn't even out like, man, I denied him. I got to make up for it. I got to preach. I got to go tell people about him. He's like, well, I guess I'll go back to fishing. And so this is not an overcompensation for the mistakes that he's made. This is nothing human. This is all the Holy Spirit working in Peter's life. And here's how the Sanhedrin responds in verse 13. The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, for they could see that they were ordinary men with no special training in the scriptures. They also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. I want to pause there for a moment because that's, that should be a goal of ours. We don't need to be schooled or extraordinary. I would rather be unschooled and ordinary, but people to be like, he's been with Jesus. So they recognized that they had been with Jesus, but since they could see the man who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing that they could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and they conferred among themselves. They said, what should we do with these guys? They, we can't deny that they've performed a miraculous sign and everybody in the city knows about it, but to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name. So they called the apostles back in and they, they like, you, look, you can't talk about Jesus anymore. We're gonna let you go, but you can't talk about Jesus. And Peter and John reply and they say, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We're not gonna stop telling about everything that we've seen and heard. And the council, they had, no, they had no leg to stand on. They couldn't do anything. They're like, well, still don't, but still don't do it, okay? And finally they let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. All they could do was threaten them and just be like, you, you better not. And that's as much as they could say because everyone is praising God for the miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. So this boldness is just changing people. It's changing their community. It's changing their, the way that they're interacting with people. It's giving them the confidence to step out and to heal a man when they've been t- told to cease and desist, right? But it brings us to our next point. The Holy Spirit empowered Peter to be bold, but the next thing the Holy Spirit did was it empowered Peter to be favored. Jot that down. 
The Holy Spirit empowered Peter to be favored. See, they found themselves in these positions of favor and protection, even when they're in the belly of the beast, so to speak. I mean, this wasn't the only time that they were in front of the Sanhedrin. One chapter later, they're thrown in jail again. This time, an angel comes and sets them free, and instead of running, they keep preaching. They just go to the temple courts, and they're like, we're going to keep preaching. And again, the, so the Sanhedrin go to find them. They find that the, that the cell doors are locked, but that there's nobody in there. And so they're like, I don't know how they got out, but they must have run off. Oh, wait, they're just down the street preaching again. So they pull them back in, and they can't give them much more than a slap on the wrist. They continue to find favor left and right. In fact, if we flip back to Acts chapter 2, verse 46 Every day, the, the early church, they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Now, favor doesn't always look the way that we expect it to. Like, most of us would not look at this. Most of us would say, the favor I'm looking for is not to be put in jail at all. Right. But that's not the favor they got. Some th sometimes things don't look the way that we want them to, and sometimes they have to get worse before they can get better. I remember early on in my days here uh, as a staff member at iTown, when I first started, I was in charge of our live service production and the creative stuff. I don't do much of the live service stuff anymore, but I remember the first time that we got any colored lights for anything. This was probably close to 10 years ago on the stage at our old Fishers campus. And we put up some white, just like cardboard pieces basically on the wall, like poster board. Like we basically went down to Staples and got ourselves some poster board for a science project and then put them on the wall, threw some colored lights at them. And every song had a color, like this song is blue now. And now it's pink. And we thought it was great. We're like, this is amazing. Wow, it just totally changes the game on everything. And so, we were running through all of that, and all of that was running from this little Windows computer, like an all-in-one computer, the monitor and everything. And, uh, and I don't, I'm not a big fan of Windows computers anyways. And we get to the moment in service when the video happens. And so the vi when videos happen, just like it happened just a few minutes ago to all of our campuses, the stage lights will go dark, but the lights, the house lights over the people will stay a little bit lit. And so... It gets to that moment, the stage lights go black, house lights are good, but then the whole computer freezes. And it, we're in videos, we got a couple minutes, and I make the decision that like, this thing's gonna freeze, I've seen the blue screen of death before, like it's not gonna, it's not gonna come back. It, th there's no holding out hope. So we have to restart the computer. So we shut it down, and when you shut down the computer, all the lights stay the way that they are, so it's great. So I was like, cool, we're gonna, we're gonna start the computer back up. And it gets through all the videos and Pastor Dave comes onto the stage and the video ends and the computer is still in the process of restarting. And so the lights on him don't come up. And so he's just staring out at a crowd of people that he can see very clearly because those lights are on, but they can't see him. And he just says, no lights, huh? <laughs> and at that moment, the computer reboots, but when it reboots, it doesn't like, continue what it was doing, it actually shuts off all of the lights. <laughs> so he says, no lights, huh? Blackout. And in complete darkness, he just goes, well, <laughs> and there's not much else you can do. And unfortunately, or unfortunately, just a few seconds later, the computer, you know, like st finished starting up. We grabbed a hold of the lights, got the lights back on and continued out the service. But like, had we not restarted the computer and had we not gone to complete blackout, he would have just preached a whole sermon where he could see them and they couldn't see him, which would be pretty awkward. And so it had to go dark. It had to get worse before it got better. And I think sometimes we don't have that kind of perspective about our life. We, we see our trajectory as this, but that's not the way things work. And sometimes things have to go down before they go up. Sometimes they have to get worse before they get better. And it was like that for Peter and the early church because things always seemed to go a little bit wrong before they would go right. Like they'd get thrown in jail, but then they'd get released from jail. And 
I don't want to get ahead in our series, but a few chapters later, the Sanhedrin finally has the guts to do it. They, they actually have it in and, and kill a guy named Stephen. And Stephen is a follower of Jesus, and that's why he gets killed. And it's a man named Saul who gives these orders to kill Stephen. And while it looks like a pretty devastating blow, Saul actually goes, to, goes on to become one of the most influential leaders in the early church. And it all had to happen that way in order for the gospel to go to the Gentiles, the gospel to go to everybody, to move from this small group of people to the whole world, to open it all up. And so it doesn't always go the way that we think, but God always knows what he's doing. And we have to trust that he always knows what he's doing. Now, pre-Holy Spirit Peter, after getting thrown in jail twice, being threatened and getting flogged, which is what happened after they got put back in front of the Sanhedrin, he would not have seen that as favor. He might not have even gotten to that point. But after all of that, in Acts chapter 5, verse 41, Peter and the apostles, <clears throat> they left the high council rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of God. They counted, they were like, isn't it so great that we got to get beaten for following Jesus? And I just think that's such a Holy Spirit perspective to see that as favor, to see that as like God is watching out for us because they knew that what was happening to them in this earth did not uh, negatively impact eternity. In fact, it was storing up for them treasures in heaven because they were standing up for what they believed in. They were standing up for the gospel. They were standing up in the face of all of that. They were bold and they were finding favor the third thing that we see in all of this is that the Holy Spirit empowered Peter to stay faithful. Jot that down. The Holy Spirit empowered Peter to be faithful because not only did they rejoice at the flogging and the persecution that they faced, but the very next verse in verse 42, it says in every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach the message, Jesus is the Messiah. They continued to preach, they continued to do it. After all of that, Peter continued on. He continued to live with boldness. He continued to chase after Jesus with everything he had. He wasn't perfect by any means because none of us are. But down to the very last correspondence we have from Peter. In 2 Peter chapter three, these are the last verses of the last correspondence that we have from Peter. He says, so be on guard then, so you will not be carried away by the errors of these wicked people and lose your own secure footing. Rather, you must grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All glory to him, both now and forever, amen. This is the last biblical account we have of Peter, but most scholars believe that Peter was eventually martyred for his faith. He was actually crucified. Some of them believe he was crucified upside down because he didn't consider himself to be worthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus. Either way, it's generally agreed that he was martyred for his faith. For a guy who couldn't even tell a little girl that he believed in Jesus, that he knew Jesus even, for a guy that, that was wishy-washy and, and had a good heart, the potential was there, but he just, he wasn't there. This is pretty crazy. This is something that only comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because we have a real enemy. The devil is real. And as we chase and pursue the Lord with everything that is in us, he would love nothing more than to take us out. He would love nothing more than to shut us down, especially as we, as we preach the gospel with our lives and with our words. He would love nothing more than to shut that down. He doesn't want us to make a difference in the world around us. At best, or at worst, he wants to shut us up and silence us, but he wants to take you and I out. And so if we're gonna stay in this fight, if we're gonna stay in the race, we need the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to stay in this race because the Holy Spirit makes us better. The Holy Spirit empowers us to live this life, to resist the enemy. And when we resist him, he must flee. But we can't go through life white knuckling it and just trying to be a better Christian. And I'm just, I'm, this time I'm gonna do better and I'm, I'm not gonna say those things and I'm not gonna feel that way. It's like, 
You can try all you want, but eventually it's all gonna run out. If you try to do it on your own, you need the Holy Spirit. If we're gonna hold fast to our faith like Peter, if we're gonna be on guard, if we're gonna be secure in our footing, growing in grace, giving God the glory, we need the Holy Spirit. We cannot do this on our own. Would you bow your heads for just a moment at every campus? I wanna pray in just a moment that, that all of us would be filled with the Holy Spirit, overcome with the Holy Spirit, that we would not try to white knuckle it anymore, that we would not try to do this on our own, but that we would lean on the power of the Holy Spirit, recognizing that the Holy Spirit makes us bold, helps us to stand firm, to remain faithful, and gives us favor. I wanna, I wanna pray that over all of us. But for some of you here today, maybe at Mudsock, Bluffton, watching online, the correctional facilities, wherever you're at today, you don't have a relationship with Jesus. That's the start of all of it. I want you to know that Jesus came to this earth. He died a brutal death after living a perfect life. And he gave his life up willingly. The Bible says it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. That joy was you. He doesn't wanna condemn you. He wants to set you free. All you have to do is turn from the old life, give up your life to him, and he'll give you a brand new life. The Bible says he'll wash away all of that. He'll set your sin from you as far as the east is from the west. He'll give you a brand new life in him. So with nobody looking around at every campus, every head is bowed, every eye is closed, I'm gonna lead you in a simple prayer. You can pray it quietly in your heart, but you have to mean it. We're not gonna single you out or embarrass you, but I do want you to take a bold step of faith right now as nobody's looking around. If you wanna pray that prayer, if you're ready to give your life to Jesus today, would you just shoot your hand up high right now? Just say, I'm ready to give my life to Jesus. Yeah, yeah. Is there anybody else? I don't want this moment to pass you by. Yeah. You could put your hands down. If, if you lifted your hand or even if you wanted to, you just couldn't do it, but you're ready to give your life to Jesus, pray this simple prayer. Just say, dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross in my place. Thank you for paying the price for my sin. Thank you that you make me new. God, I turn from my old ways and I turn to you today. Just whisper these words, just say, I give you my life in Jesus' name. God, I pray for each and every one of us. If you're here today and you're desperate for the Holy Spirit, then this is for you. I want you to pray with me, join our faith together. God. We lift up to you, God, right now, each and every one of us. God, we pray that you would fill us with your spirit, God, that you would pour out your spirit on us. God, we're tired of trying to do this on our own. We can't. But God, thank you that we don't have to. Thank you that you gave us your spirit. God, we pray that you would empower us to live a life like Peter, bold, favored, and faithful, God. We pray that you would use us in a mighty way, Lord, that you would gift us, not for ourselves, but that you would empower us to go out into the world and to preach your good news with our lives, that we could love people, serve people. God, I pray that you would help us to live this life for you. God, we we dethrone ourselves. We stop trying to measure up. We stop trying to be good enough. God, we'll never be good enough. But God, thank you that you working through us is. So God, we just pray that you would fill us. God, use us. God, help us to leave this place changed. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise one more time for those who made a decision to follow him. Thank you so much for joining iTown Church online today. 
We would love to have the chance to meet you and your family in person at one of our campuses. Or of course, you can join us streaming live online this weekend. Now for more details about times and locations and even some of our streaming options, you can go to itownchurch.com. I sure hope to see you soon and God bless.